What's going on, Imperial? It's Emperor Cubone here. If there's one thing the Pokemon Company loves, it's legendaries. You can tell because they keep putting them on the box. But if there's one thing they love about legendaries, it's to have them be connected to other legendaries. This happens in some capacity for just about every region out there. And an interesting pattern to note is the propensity for lumping these majestic creatures into groups of three. Maybe it's some sort of symbolic mirror to the three starters that we always have? I don't know why, I just know that's how they usually do it. This is on full display in the new Crown Tundra, where there's a revamped version of a trio that we already had by giving us Galarian forms of the Kanto legendary birds. These come with fresh new looks and even new types to change up the interplay between the birds that we've known for years. But that's what got me thinking. See, with the Psychic, Fighting, and Dark setup, they would each have an advantage and disadvantage in either direction. But that's not the end of it. They're also all Flying types, which means the Fighting would only be neutral against the Dark Moltres. Combine that with the fact that it's completely immune to Articuno's Psychic instead of simply resisting it, and this arrangement starts to seem rather unbalanced. So the next question is, naturally, which legendary trio is the most imbalanced when it comes to their ability to take each other on? Not necessarily just from a competitive perspective, but that will be taken into account as well. And we will only be counting official trios, so the likes of the four Tapus wouldn't count. Even though I think we can all agree that Tapu Fini has it the hardest. But that will not exclude groupings that have a removable member such as Keldeo. We'll simply forego their inclusion. So, starting with the legendary birds in their original form, we can see that on top of all having the flying type, their defining traits are Moltres being fire, Zapdos being electric, and Articuno being ice. Now with Articuno being my favorite, I immediately see the red flags in that it's completely disadvantaged. Moltres is neutral to ice and can melt it in return. And while ice could take down Zapdos, electricity takes down both of the others. And since Zapdos is faster than both of them, I think we can guess who will strike first. So with Zapdos having double wins and Articuno having double losses, this seems pretty out of balance. Next we have the legendary beasts in Johto, and we can pretty much draw a straight line where Entei loses to Suicune, who loses to Raikou. So that seems pretty straightforward. However, Raikou lacks the super effective power to one-shot Entei. And the Volcano Pokémon is faster than Suicune, so, all things considered, this matchup could be anybody's game if they use the right moves. If we look at the Hoenn game mascots, on the surface, it seems pretty unfair for Groudon. Since Rayquaza is immune to its stab moves, and Kyogre has super effective hits to kill it. But Groudon can even the playing field a bit after Gen 6, crank them all up to 11. With the Primals and Mega Rayquaza, things quickly go to extremes and Groudon still loses out when suppressed by the other's harsh weather conditions. However, if Groudon is a little slower on the draw, it can get the last word and make sure Desolate Land is in effect. This means water moves can't even be used against it. So with the right coverage moves, Groudon could do some serious work. But in reality, if Groudon doesn't get this stroke of luck, it's gonna lose. Hard. Moving to the Sinnoh region mascot legendaries, we can see that they're all dragon types, so that's a shared strength and weakness amongst all of them. However, it's not that simple, since Dialga is also a steel type. This means that dragon comes to a neutral hit on Dialga, while it can just roar time all over the other two super effectively. And it was even better for Dialga when it first came out, since back then steel still resisted ghost. And with Dragon obviously resisting water, that means Dialga is damaged neutrally or less by its other two counterparts. Beyond that though, Palkia and Giratina could both have their days on top, it just takes the right circumstances. Sinnoh also had the Lake Trio Guardians, except these Pokémon are all pretty much the same. They're all pure Psychic types with the exact same base stat total. The only difference is that Azelf is a little more offensive, Yuxi is a little more defensive, and Mesprit is splitting the difference. Do they even have different movesets? Probably, I don't know, let me check. Okay, let's see. Mm, got that over there. Well, so there's not really any standouts. I mean, they can all get access to U-Turn, Knock Off, and Shadow Ball, so I guess it's just a toss-up to see which one comes out on top as the winner. 
When I started with this idea, I was particularly interested to see how these Swords of Justice would fare. As we know, these quadrupeds are all fighting type, with the additional bonuses of having steel, rock, and grass. This immediately puts Terrakion on the back foot for being weak to all of the types of the other two, but where steel has been an advantage before, we can see that it actually compromises Cobalion, since the other two have Biting Stab to bite back, although Cobalion's defense is through the roof. And with Verizion seemingly coming out on top, there are of course coverage moves all around. So honestly, Verizion could believably be usurped since all of the Musketeers have the same speed, leaving it to feel pretty balanced overall. Unova also had the Forces of Nature as another trio, and this one is a bit harder to determine. See, Tornadus being the first ever pure flying type makes this unique on its own, but paired with Landorus means that they can only use stab flying moves against each other. Thunderous also throws a wrench in the works, since it could obliterate Tornadus, but would do nothing to Landorus's ground. However, even though Landorus can't use its ground moves on either of them, it does have access to numerous powerful rock moves that could do the trick. Or just a quick smackdown could put those ground attacks back in action. However, basically, any way you slice it, Tornadus loses. Even though they do have the Therian forms to try and keep pace with one another. And 5th Gen had yet another trio with the mascot Dragon Pokémon. For the sake of comparison, we'll not look at the Curum Fusions, since that wouldn't be fair ganging up on one or the other. So, how do these extra types impact the dragons across the board? Well, the good news is that Dragon already resists electric and fire, but the bad news for Kyurem is that said fire becomes neutral both in attack and defense for the Ice Edition. Kyurem is slightly faster than the other two, so it could easily dispatch them. But I'm not going to count out a miss or a heavy speed investment that could turn the tide. So, all things considered, the Tau Trio, as they are known, fittingly are quite balanced compared to most. The Kalos region only has our XYZ Trio of Xerneas, Eveltal, and Zygarde, by far the most different that we've seen thus far. The simple fact of the matter is that Xerneas has the type advantage over both of the other two. Now, what's interesting is that Xerneas and Eveltal have the exact same stat distributions. And then, of course, there's the fact that Zygarde's ability, Aura Break, weakens the impact of the other Aura abilities that would lessen the other's blows. So it could be argued that they are more balanced even than most of the other trios that we've seen. Except that it does seem Eveltal is in the weakest position. Unless, of course, you count the trump card of if Eveltal dies, it kills the entire universe. Mutually Assured Destruction is quite the deterrent for taking it out. Aside from the overflow of Ultra Beasts in Alola, the region also gave us Solgaleo, Lunala, and Necrozma as a trio. These outer space creatures are all psychic type, but Solgaleo was also gifted with steel, Lunala has ghost, and Necrozma is monotyped. Well, usually anyway. While we will once again forego the fusions, Necrozma has another trick, where it can become Ultra Necrozma. And on top of cranking up its stats, it gains the dragon typing. However, Solgaleo not only resists Dragon, but Quad resists Psychic, so it could probably shrug off even Necrozma's strongest Z-move. Unala also has the advantage of the Ghost Typing, which gives it super effective stab against its stellar siblings. And with the speed of the Cosmog evolutions being tied, it gives the Alolan box art Pokémon a fairly equal chance when it comes to a fight over top of Necrozma. And of course, in the latest games, as far as I can tell, anyway, the only legendary trio we see is comprised of Zacian, Zamazenta, and Eternatus. Now, when we first meet these royal wolves, they are fairy and fighting, respectively, which gives Zacian a big leg up. However, when given their ancient weapons, Steel becomes the great equalizer and puts Zamazenta on level ground, since Steel is weak to fighting and also resists fairy. What's curious is that Eternatus is part poison type, which would have no effect on the steeled up states of the Sword and Shield mascots. And even then, Dragon would be resisted or flat out not effective at all. But the poison also makes it so that the fairy can't demolish this weird skeleton monster and makes it neutral. So all around, it would seem that the fabled beings of the Gala region are best off relying on coverage moves, with certain victory no more than a lucky crit away for any one of them. However, there is one other trio that I legitimately forgot about without even meaning to, 
that I think might take the cake for the most unbalanced, and that would be none other than the Reggie Trio from the Hoenn region. First of all, I don't know how I forgot about them. They're three of the most connected legendaries in the entire game. But as we are told by the names, these golems are the living embodiments of rock, ice, and steel. Now this pretty quickly makes things askew just by virtue of a mono ice type's lackluster defensive spread. Namely, in this case, being weak to both rock and steel. So Regice gets overwhelmed by both of the other two. But worse than that, is that Regirock is also weak to steel. And it's really easy to compare all of their stats, since they all have the same HP and speed, with a variable 450 amongst all of the other stats. Regirock looks to be the best off with 100 in attack and 200 in defense. So, even being weak to steel, it can take a few hits from Registeel's 75 attack. And even with coverage moves like Hammer Arm at Regice's disposal, it's got a terribly low 50 for attack. So most of those physical moves wouldn't be able to break through on the massive defenses of the other two more solid Regis before they would fell their frigid foe. And even though Regigigas isn't exactly in consideration with this trio, it is worth noting that its normal typing would also not fare well against rock and steel opponents. So how exactly does it keep order between them all again? Maybe it could change if the newer Regis get a third member, like I anticipate, but for now, it seems to me when you look at all of the vast superiority of Registeel and the vast inferiority of Regice, it makes this group the most unbalanced out of all of the legendary Pokemon trios. At least for right now, anyway. Which legendary trios do you find the most lopsided? Let me know down in the comments. Also, be sure to leave a like, share this video, and subscribe so that you too can become an Imperial today. We'll see you around next time! <laughs>